There was more in her, she said, than people thought, and when you came to know her, you were surprised how much she had read and how entertaining she could be. She was the last woman in the world to commit murder. Mr. Joyce dismissed Robert Crosby with such reassuring words as he could find, and once more, alone in his office, turned over the pages of the brief. But it was a mechanical action, for all its details were familiar to him. The case was the sensation of the day, and it was discussed in all the clubs, at all the dinner tables, up and down the peninsula, from Singapore to Penang. The facts that Mrs. Crosby gave were simple. Her husband had gone to Singapore on business, and she was alone for the night. She dined by herself late at a quarter to nine, and after dinner she sat on the sitting room working at her lace. It opened on the veranda. There was no one in the bungalow, for the servants had retired to their own quarters in the back of the uh, compound. She was surprised to hear a step on the gravel path uh, <clears throat> in the garden, a booted step which suggested a white man rather than a native, for she had not heard a motor drive up, and she could not imagine who could be coming to see her at that time of night. Someone ascended the few stairs that led up to the bungalow, walked across the veranda, and appeared at the door of the room in which she sat. At the first moment, she did not recognize the visitor. She sat with a shaded lamp, and he stood with his back to the darkness. May I come in, he said. She did not even recognize the voice. Who is it, she asked. She worked with spectacles, and she took them off as she spoke. Jeff Hammond. Of course, come in and have a drink. She rose and shook hands with him cordially. She was a little surprised to see him, for though he was a neighbor, neither she nor Robert had seen him lately, had been on very intimate terms with him, and she had not seen him for some weeks. He was the manager of a rubber estate nearly eight miles from theirs, and she wondered why he had chosen this late hour to come and see them. Robert's away, she said. He had to go to Singapore for the night. Perhaps he thought his visit called for some explanation, for he said, I'm sorry, I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come along and see how you were getting on. How on earth did you come? I never heard the car. I left it down the road. I thought you might both be in bed and asleep. Well, this was natural enough. The planter gets up at dawn in order to take the roll call of the workers, and soon after dinner he is glad to go to bed. Hammond's car was, in point of fact, found the next day a quarter of a mile from the bungalow. Since Robert was away, there was no whiskey and soda in the room. Leslie did not call the boy, who was probably asleep, but fetched it herself. Her guest mixed himself a drink and filled his pipe. Jeff Hammond had a host of friends in the colony. He was, at this time, in the late thirties, but he had come out as a lad. He uh, had been one of the very first to volunteer at the outbreak of war, and he had done very well. A wound in the knee had caused him to be invalided out of the army after two years. But he returned to the Federated Malay States with a DSO and an MC. He was one of the best billiard players in the colony. He had been a beautiful dancer and a fine tennis player, but though no longer able to dance and his tennis with a stiff knee was not so good as it had been, he had the gift of popularity and was universally liked. He was a tall, good-looking fellow with attractive blue eyes and a fine head of black curling hair. Old stagers said his only fault was that he was too fond of the girls. And after the catastrophe, they shook their heads and vowed that they had always known that this would get him into trouble. He began now to talk with Leslie about the local affairs, the forthcoming races at Singapore, the price of rubber, and his chances of killing a tiger which had been lately seen in the neighborhood. She was anxious to finish by a certain date a piece of lace on which she was working, for she wanted to send it home for her mother's birthday. So she put on her spectacles again and drew towards her chair the little table on which stood the pillow. The pillow. I wish you wouldn't wear those great horn spectacles, he said. I don't know why a pretty woman should do her best to look plain. She was a trifle taken aback at the remark. He had never used that tone with her before. She thought the best thing was to make light of it. I have no pretensions of being a raving beauty, you know, and if you ask me point blank, I'm bound to tell you I don't care two pins if you think me plain or not. I don't think you're plain. I think you're awfully pretty. Sweet of you, she answered ironically, but in that case I can only think you half-witted. <laughs> He chuckled, but he rose from his chair and sat down in another by her side. You are not going to have the face to deny that you have the prettiest hands in the world, he said. He made a gesture as though to take one of them. She gave him a little tap. Don't be an idiot. Sit down where you were before and talk sensibly or I shall send you home. He did not move. Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you, he said. She remained quite cool. 
I don't. I don't believe it for a minute. And even if it were true, I don't want you to say it. She was the more surprised at what he was saying, since during the seven years she had known him, he had never paid her any particular attention. When he came back from the war, they had seen a good deal of one another, and once when he was ill, Robert had gone over and brought him back to their bungalow in his car. She had stayed, he had stayed with them for a fortnight. But their interests were dissimilar. Their acquaintance had never uh, ripened into friendship. For the last two or three years, they had seen little of him. Now and then he came to play tennis. Now and then they met him at some planters who was giving a party. But it often happened that they did not set eyes on him for a month at a time. Now he took another whiskey and soda. Leslie wondered if he had been drinking before. There was something odd about him, and it made her a trifle uneasy. She watched, watched him help himself with disapproval. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, she said good-humoredly, still. He emptied his glass and put it down. Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk, he said abruptly. Well, that is the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Well, it's a lie. I've loved you ever since I first knew you. I've held my tongue as long as I could, and now it's got to come out. I love you, I love you, I love you. She rose and carefully put aside the pillow. Good night, she said. I'm not going now. At last, she began to lose her temper. But you poor fool, don't you know that I've never loved anyone but Robert, and even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. What do I care? Robert's away. <laughs> if you don't go away this minute, I shall call the boys and have you thrown out. They're out of earshot. She was very angry now. She made a movement as though to go onto the veranda from which the houseboy would certainly hear her, but he seized her arm. Let me go, she cried furiously. Not much I've got you now. She opened her mouth and called, Boy, boy, but with a quick gesture he put his hand over it. Then, before she knew what he was about, he had taken her in her arms and was kissing her passionately. She struggled, turning her lips away from his burning mouth. No, 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 she cried. Leave me alone, I won't. <laughs> She grew confused about what happened then. All that had been said before she remembered accurately, but now his words assailed her ears through a mist of horror and fear. He seemed to plead for her love. He broke into violent protestations of passion, and all the time he held her in his tempestuous embrace. She was helpless, for he was a strong, powerful man, and her arms were pinioned to her sides. Her struggles were unavailing, and she felt herself grow weaker. She was afraid she would faint, and his hot breath on her face made her feel desperately sick. He kissed her mouth, her eyes, her cheeks, her hair. The pressure of his arms was killing her. He lifted her off her feet. She tried to kick him, but he only held her more closely. He was carrying her now. She was, he wasn't speaking anymore, but she knew that his face was pale, and his eyes hot with desire. He was taking her into the bedroom. He was no longer a civilized man, but a savage. And as he ran, he stumbled against a table, which was in the way. His stiff knee made him a little awkward on his feet, and with the burden of the woman in his arms, he fell. In a moment, she had snatched herself away from him. She ran around the sofa. He was up in a flash and flung himself toward her. There was a revolver on the desk. She was not a nervous woman, but Robert was to be away for the night, and she'd meant to take it into her room when she went to bed. That was why it happened to be there. She was frantic with terror now. She did not know what she was doing. She heard a report. She saw Hammond stagger. He gave a cry. He said something. She didn't know what. He lurched out of the room and onto the veranda. She was in a frenzy now. She was beside herself. She followed him out. Yes, yes, that was it. She must have followed him out, though she remembered nothing of it. She followed, firing automatically, shot after shot, till the six chambers were empty, Hammond fell down on the floor of the veranda. He crumpled up into a bloody heap. When the boys, startled by the report, rushed up, they found her standing over Hammond with the revolver still in her hand and Hammond lifeless. She looked at them for a moment without speaking. They stood in a frightened, huddled bunch. She let the revolver fall from her hand and without a word turned and went into the sitting room. They watched her go into the bedroom and turned the key in the lock. They dared not touch the dead body, but looked at it with terrified eyes.